Hello, welcome to the Farm Labor Supervisor COVID-19 Safety Updates, updated in May of 2021, how to reduce risks and protect your people. And this is a program by the University of Florida IFAS, um, SWIFREC, the Southwest Florida Regional Education Center. And um, it's part of the Farm Labor Supervisor Training Program. Oh, and I'm Carlene Thyssen. I, I was uh, one of the founders of the program and uh, developed a lot of the courses and have been, have been with it since the beginning. Okay, how to reduce risks and protect your people. This presentation was developed by the Farm Labor Supervisor Training Program. And what we're gonna share with you is based on the most recently updated information from the Center for Disease Control, the Florida Department of Health, and also related agencies and organizations at the forefront of scientific understanding of COVID-19. We do not claim to have any scientific knowledge of human health beyond the scope of the above mentioned body of expertise. But we do have an understanding of the work environment of the people who supervise farm workers in Florida. That's what we teach. Our goal is to educate our audience with recommendations for safe, healthy work environments on the farm and off the farm and also provide strategies for agribusiness risk management. While this presentation was designed for the supervisors of farm workers, we also encourage the use of the information to inform farm workers, owners, and managers. So part one, let's see what we know. We know that COVID-19 spreads through droplets of saliva or mucus, that symptoms may appear two to 14 days after infection. We know it survives in the air for an unknown amount of time. And one of the biggest issues is 50% of people may have no symptoms at all. Um, and then another little point I'd like to mention there too, a lot of people are tested positive and they feel fine for a few days. So keep that two to 14 days after infection in mind because it can take a little while and then um, emerge. Um, and there are new variants coming from different countries. So far the vaccines we have are supposed to be able to handle them, but uh, we'll see. And um, this is likely to become endemic like the annual flu virus. Viruses pay no attention to borders. And we mentioned that, of course, as we all know, a lot of our workers are not from these borders. Okay, so here as of May 12th, the number of new cases, look at Florida in that dark burgundy color. So Texas and Florida, were the uh, highest, and at that time, 3,000 cases a day were coming up in Florida and Texas. And then here's the deaths per day. We're uh, not looking good there either. Um, 100 to 102, based on the color range, deaths per day um, on May 12th. All right, why are we still at risk? A uh, big part of it is because people have underlying medical conditions and they are at increased risk. People with chronic kidney disease, obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, heart disease, uh, people with diagnosed diabetes, obesity all by itself, um, asthma and high blood pressure. And here, oh, here are the cases of the variants of concern in the United States. And this is in April, but we have those dark numbers again. There were in Florida, 751 plus cases of the variants. So here's everything we know. Everybody 12 years of age now can get a COVID-19 vaccination. The vaccines are safe and effective. You may have side effects after vaccination, but they're normal. 
Uh, and part of the problem sometimes with workers is they see people with those side effects and they, um, they think they're, they're getting the disease from the vaccination, which is not true. It typically takes two weeks after the vaccination for the body to build the immunity against the virus. So you have to, you're really supposed to wait two weeks until after a second dose, after a second dose. Um, so here's, we, on this chart, you can learn how to find a COVID-19 vaccine so you can get it as soon as you can. People who have been fully vaccinated can start to do some things they had stopped doing because of the pandemic. So we're still learning how well the vaccines are gonna present, uh, prevent us from spreading the virus to others, but early data shows the vaccines help keep people with no symptoms from spreading it. And we're still learning how long it vaccinates people. We don't know that yet. We're still learning how many people have to be vaccinated before the population be, can, can be considered protected. And we are still learning how effective the vaccines are against the new variants. Okay, we have a brief video by Dr. Michael Loz Lozardo. He's the deputy director of the UF Emerging Pathogens Institute and the UF uh, director of health screen test and protect. Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Lozardo director of UF Health's Screen Test and Protect program, and I'm here to bust myths around the COVID-19 vaccines. That's false. The COVID-19 vaccines are extremely effective in preventing COVID-19 illness and any symptoms at all from COVID-19. They're even more effective in preventing serious illness that might result in hospitalization or death. So therefore, this statement is false. This is also false. The COVID-19 vaccines have been given over 210 million doses throughout the United States, not to mention that other doses have been given throughout the world. Death is extremely uncommon related to COVID-19 vaccination, far less common than it is with other more commonly given vaccinations that all of us have taken ourselves. So therefore, this myth is false. This is false. There have not been a lot of errors with vaccine administration. Through our team alone, we've given over 50,000 doses and more than 110,000 doses have been given Alachua County with extremely rare circumstances where there was a, a mistake of any kind that was able to be detected, far less than what you would see with other vaccinations. Although having had COVID and getting that infection naturally will provide you some immunity and protection, there's a growing body of evidence that shows that the immunity that you get from getting vaccinated provides far greater uh, and a far greater an immune response that's more protective. Um, it's important to keep that in mind because many people who think that because they've been infected, they don't pose a risk to others and that they themselves are gonna be safe, need to keep in mind that it's not clear that they don't pose a risk to others and that they may have mild illness and still spread it to one of their loved ones who may be more vulnerable. For that reason, the CDC and our team also recommends that people get vaccinated at least two weeks after they've recovered from COVID uh, infection or even if they've had a remote uh, experience with COVID to go ahead and get vaccinated and complete the series. So it's understandable that a lot of people believe that these vaccines are quote unquote experimental. They're not experimental. And the reason why I think people believe this is because the EUA, the emergency use authorization, 
That is more of a technical term that allows the vaccines to be used before they complete the bureaucratic process to be fully cleared by the FDA under after a certain period of time. That FDA formal approval is coming here very shortly. When you look at the numbers of people that have been vaccinated, over 200 million doses having been administered in the United States alone and, and increasing by at least 2 million per day. Um, the thought that this is an experimental vaccine is not true. Also, the fact that these did complete a full series of clinical trials and went through the same vig or vigorous uh, scientific process that all the medications in your medicine cabinet have, have, have gone through, all the vaccines you've ever gone through, these have gone through that same rigorous process. The difference? A lot of the bureaucratic red tape was kind of taken out of the way because of the emergency which the world was facing. And for that reason, these vaccines are considered extremely safe. And now with the experience of over 200 million doses over the last six months, we can have a lot of confidence to say that we can continue to move forward and that these vaccines are not experimental. It's time to do your part. Okay, great message. All right, now we can use a similar map to look at the percentage of population that has two vaccine doses or had as of May 12th. And uh, we are, I wish we were in darker numbers there, but in any case, we have a probably somewhere right there in the middle. Um, so 35% maybe, and I'm not sure um, how far up that goes, but we're getting there. Okay, here is a little interesting chart about the activities that people may or may not do and whether or not they should be wearing masks. So if you look over on the right for to start, fully vaccinated people can do all of those things without masks. So I'm just gonna pick a couple, dine at an outdoor restaurant with friends from multiple households, go to oh, visit a barber or a hair salon, go to an indoor movie theater, um, sing in an indoor chorus. That's big because singing really spreads germs and uh, participate in an in indoor high intensity exercise class. You can do all that without a mask if you're fully vaccinated. The unvaccinated people can do two things safely, outdoors uh, for a walk or a run and attend a small outdoor gathering with family and friends if they are fully vaccinated. But everything else, um, it's suggested that people don't do them or that they do them wearing masks. All right, part two, COVID-19 in agriculture. We have just a couple of examples here. Uh, this is Fred Garcia, he's a crew leader and um, Fred had the COVID and allowed us to use his picture and tell, tell the story. He had flu symptoms and I've heard this before, he felt fine during the day, but at night he would get night sweats and a fever that ran up and down. He ended up in the hospital for two days and that weekend he got worse and he had pneumonia and went back to the hospital for another five days. Fred, when I talked to him, and this was last summer, um, he said what it was like. He said he had nonstop headaches for 15 days. And a month after he had it, he is still not well. His chest tightens and he can't take what he called a nice breath. Um, and with Fred and with others, it can take three or four days to recover for every day you're sick. So Fred's message and ours is stay safe, distance and wear masks. And Fred said, take it seriously because it is. And another local crew leader that we have 
um, some information on Carleen Newham and his wife. Uh, he was he was a hands on kind of guy. He had two buses for his crew, one of which he drove himself. Well, on the last day of work before he went on vacation, he started looking kind of tired. Well, on Monday, then May 19th, he got sick again, flu-like symptoms. So he went and got the COVID test. On Tuesday, he couldn't breathe. So his wife took him into the hospital. And the following week, he got transported up to an Orlando Medical Center for further treatment. And on June 5th, he passed away. And that's just 17 days between his first symptoms and passing away. And as you can see, he was he he was in pretty decent shape, not too old. Well, in talking to his his wife, she gave permission to share this uh, with everyone here. And this is what Lisa said about Joe. I lost my husband of 32 years, a young, healthy, loving man that always looked to help others. It was his last day of work before he would get to enjoy his summer vacation. And instead, I had to take him to the hospital and had to leave him there all alone. I don't get to see him walk in our front door anymore. I don't get to hear, I love you. I don't get to feel his hugs. I don't get to talk to him when I'm acting crazy and he tells me it's okay. I lost my person, the one who was supposed to grow old with me. And that's Joe's wife, Lisa, um, following Joe's death from COVID. Okay, so let's just talk briefly here. We're gonna talk more about it in the next section. The exposure risk among ag workers, the distinctive factors that affect the risk of COVID-19 is how far people are from each other, the distance between workers, how long they're close to each other and what type of contact they're having. And these are big factors. So talking about type of contact and duration, shared transportation. Most workers are taken to the fields in buses or vans. Shared living quarters, shared cooking and eating areas, bathrooms and laundry facilities. Watch the laundry facilities because they're often forgotten. Uh, they live in crowded and multi-generational housing. They have a lot of contact with other houses in the community and they don't have good access to clean water. And um, here are the variations. We also have a large um, Hispanic um, population and black. We have in down in this area, we have a lot of Haitian workers. Um, so anyway, we have, um, here's the risk. And this is basically compared to white people, white non-Hispanic people. So if you look across the top, if white people get one percentage point, the American Indians are 1.6 times that. And uh, we'll go, well, Asians, we have some Asian workers over in the homestead area as well. So they're actually better off. Um, black people, 1.1 times the number of cases and Hispanics have two times the number of cases. Um, people in the hospital, American Indians, three and a half times white people, Asians write the same. Uh, black or African-American people, 2.8, and Hispanics in terms of being hospitalized is up to three times the white population. Um, and then people who actually die, the highest number is the American Indians, um, and then Asians right on par with white people. Uh, black people uh, are 1.9 and Hispanics 2.3. So we do have a significant uh, difference by ethnic group. Right. So as you can see, the population that makes up uh, 
a lot of our agricultural workers are at much higher risk of uh, hospitalization, serious cases, death. So what we want to do now is talk about some specifics in the part three. It's what can you do in an agriculture setting to protect the supervisors and protect your workers? And the, that picture on the left is a group of Henry County Health Department workers who a couple of weeks ago had been invited out to a farm and they gave, uh, I think, well over 100 second shots to the uh, ag workers that were uh, working on that farm. So if, if you're an ag employer, we would strongly urge you to contact your local health department because they will come out to your property. Uh, so it's easy peasy. Uh, you can gather your workers together and everybody can get vaccinated and it, it helps not having to figure out transportation issues and time issues so contact your health department because they'll be uh they'll be more than happy to come out um so what we're going to cover now again is what can you do for your workers masks and frequent hygiene measures uh what can you do to at the work sites? And what do you do if someone gets sick? And we're going to cover all these. These are all based, again, on CDC uh, uh, suggestions, recommendations. Um, we, don't, we don't make them up. We take them from the Center for Disease Control and recommended by them of things to do, uh, precautions to take, how to deal with situations. And let's start at the beginning of the workday, which is screening workers, that it's recommended that everybody have a, their temperature taken. Uh, they use these no-touch infrared thermometers, as you can see in the picture there. Uh, if the temperature registers over 100.4, CDC recommends that that's the point where you need to take some action because it's potentially a... Uh, a case of COVID-19. This should be done before they start work, before they get on their buses, uh, early in the process of the day, so that less opportunity to infect other workers. And there has been some, some uh, problems with suspicion of these things. So you may need to reassure your workers that uh, these temperature, the thermometers don't even touch your body and they certainly don't put anything into your body and, and they don't use x-rays or anything that could conceivably cause cancer. One of the best methods I saw that a crew leader used is he mounted uh, a th infrared thermometer at the entrance to all his buses. So as the workers got on in the morning, they just paused in front of the thermometer and it took their temperature. And if they had too high a, uh, too high a temperature, it would alert them so they would know, which is a good method. So that's first thing you should do when you screen workers in the morning, take their temperatures. Uh, another thing to do with screening workers is just check for other uh, indicators that they might have it are have they been sick since the previous day are they uh are they feeling bad do they have any flu-like symptoms so screen them for various symptoms also now, one of the things, as you saw in that previous thing, that if somebody hasn't been vaccinated, when should they wear a mask? So how do you select the right masks to do this? Um, there's all different kinds out there. They recommended that you should have a mask with two or more layers of washable and breathable fabric, that it should cover your nose and mouth completely. Uh, we've all seen people that they, they wear them under their chin, they wear them on top of their head, they miss their nose, but it should completely cover your nose and mouth to be effective. It should fit snugly against the sides of your face so they don't have gaps. And if you wear glasses like I frequently do, uh, you need to make sure that they have a nose wire so that the mask will fit uh, relatively tightly across the bridge of your nose. That helps seal the top of the mask and keep your glasses from fogging up. Uh, they do say that the sole use of a, of a shield is not recommended. They're still checking to see how well it works. Uh, but perhaps with a mask, a shield is good. Also, some gaiters don't work real well. That if you do use a gaiter, uh, 
make sure it has two layers, that it's the washable, breathable fabric. If it's only a single layer, you might be able to fold it over and that way you can uh, make it more effective. And again, a use of a mask for uh, unvaccinated people, especially when they're within six feet of each other, um, that's what you need to do. And as we briefly mentioned, this is the outline of uh, how, to, how to wear the mask. Again, you needs to cover your, your uh, nose and your mouth to be effective. And, and when you take off your mask, you need to remember that the idea of the mask is to capture virus particles. And if you take it off and touch a lot of it, you may be getting those virus particles on your hands. So you should also make sure that you wash your hands after you do that. So again, the masks are needed when you're unable to physical distance on the farm. So how do you accomplish that on, your, on a farm? Well, one way to reduce the physical distancing or, or to increase the distancing rather is to reduce the crew sizes. In other words, instead of having 100 people working together, divide them out so they can spread apart. Uh, stagger the work shifts, stagger breaks and meal times. In other words, instead of having 100 people all stop and eat together, try to do it uh, in a smaller group so that they can spread out while they take their breaks. Uh, alternate field rows. So instead of being in every row, they're in every other row. Anything that you can do to attempt to increase the spacing to six or more feet apart from, um, from each other, that's what you should give it a try. You could uh, alternate normal shift schedules also so that the workers are always around their same co-workers. And they refer to that as cohorts in the CDC uh, so that you don't have people mixing with each other um, that who they're not normally with. So housing in in agriculture is frequently an issue because it tends to be dense. Anything you can do to reduce the density, the fewer people, in other words, together, that is a good idea. You should attempt to keep your distance. In other words, make sure people are at least six feet apart. Position the beds six feet apart if possible. If, if it's not possible to spread them out, consider the use of sheets or curtains or other partitions between the beds. Um, and don't forget distancing also comes into play when doing social activities such as watching TV together. Uh, and don't forget visitors, that if visitors come in, they need to abide by the same regulations that you have for your workers. And a big deal is to improve the ventilation if possible. They've shown that uh, CDC says that increased ventilation in indoors is very important to keeping, um, keeping the spread down. So increase your ventilation, open windows, uh, more fans, more movement of air. One thing in the, when the shared housing in the beds, don't forget to try to put head to toe. In other words, in that picture, the top bunk, the head, if the person sleeps with the head against the wall, the bottom bunk, the head should be in the opposite direction to help out. Now, if you can't separate the people, consider barriers. Uh, and that picture indicates uh, we have two things. One is the uh, in the field harvesting the lettuce is they are using flexible plastic sheets to make sure that the people um, are are apart and that the air does not necessarily travel in between them. And the bottom is hard plexiglass uh, located on picnic tables in a in a lunch area in the Amakali area. Um, so shields or barriers, plexiglass, flexible, flexible uh, plastic sheeting all helps when they can't keep the six foot dis distance apart. And again, this is CDC says, you know, where they can't stay six feet apart, you need to come up with um, barriers as best you could. And again, that would include bathrooms, shared sleeping rooms, social areas, laundry areas, and kitchens. 
out in the field, you should try to add extra hand washing stations so that people don't have to be close together when washing their hands. Don't forget food safety regulations pertain to uh, a lot of the vegetables that are being harvested and require hand washing. So extra hand washing stations, one to keep uh, people at least six feet apart. Again, if you can't, consider barriers so that there is something in between the people. Uh, make sure you have cloth face coverings or masks available for everyone when they can't keep six feet apart. And in the uh, hopefully unlikely event that someone is infected, you need to make sure you have a quarantine area, especially if you're housing your workers, you need to have separate quarters for the sick workers. Make sure that you keep in touch with them, make sure that they're getting treatment. Uh, and also, of course, don't forget to provide food and water, but again, keep them separate. Uh, if you do have a person that's providing them with the food and water uh, and monitoring them, make sure that that person is furnished with protective clothing so they don't become infected. And then, of course, don't forget to make sure that if it's needed that uh, they do get transportation to doctors and that you can call 911 for emergencies. Transportation is another problem area in the ag, in the ag workforce, uh, again, because frequently bus transportation or van transportation is furnished. If you can reduce the number of people that are riding on a bus, that picture on the right shows the one person per seat. Uh, if you can do that, that's a good way to do it. You should certainly ensure that everyone on the bus wears a mask, driver and riders. Um, if if you can't reduce the number of people on a bus, that's, that's the thing that's going to help protect. Again, ventilation is good. Keep windows open, lots of air flowing. It's good to make sure the driver gets off first and gets on last. That way all of the workers don't walk by the driver and breathe on them as they come through. Uh, if you can add plexiglass or plastic curtains around the driver, that would also help. Uh, you do need to check DOT requirements before you do that. And again, before they get on the bus, the workers should sanitize, uh, wash their hands. You should sanitize the bus if possible. And after they get off, you should also clean the bus. So when they get back on it, once again, it's clean. In, a, in the housing area, socializing in adult beverages. Yeah, when you have a few adult beverages, the first thing to go is definitely your judgment. Try to encourage socializing outside, six feet apart. Uh, if, if people are gonna be close together, that's, that's a tough call. Again, masks, if you're unable to spread, uh, spread yourselves out, require masks so that they don't have as big a chance of infecting each other. And certainly don't share drinks, don't share food between each other. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if a person feels sick, they need to make sure that they tell their supervisor. Um, they need to tell, they need to. So make sure you tell your workers that there's no shame in being sick and that you need to let us know because there is shame in making others sick. And the uh, as I understand it, we have been pretty good and pretty lucky in the, um, in the Southwest Florida area that uh, there hasn't been a large number of workers infected. But keep in mind that if someone does feel sick, that you do need to take your actions. Uh, don't wait until the person is really sick. Don't wait until they've infected others. Remind the workers that home remedies don't work against this virus. And just because someone feels better doesn't mean they are better because the COVID-19 symptoms certainly come and go. So again, make sure that the workers do know that they need to uh, let their supervisors know and tell somebody when, this, when, when they feel bad so that something can be done. So again, the bottom line on all of this is try to keep your workers separated. When they're not able to be separated, if they're unvaccinated, they really should be wearing a mask in all situations. That's housing, transportation, and the work site. Our next part is gonna be discussing, well, why do you wanna do this? Um, 
there certainly are, are reasons above and beyond just keeping everyone safe. And we're going to discuss now what is the business risk and management and mitigation strategies that you can consider while you're going through the COVID crisis. Kim? Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. So in this section, we want to talk a little bit more about what the impact may be or what we what we know the best to our knowledge at this point on how how we manage our workforce, keeping them safe, keeping their health and well-being in mind um, is directly correlated to keeping your business risk management mitigated and minimized. So why is your business at risk? I mean, we know having people that are healthy is, is critical, but in terms of sort of the outside or public perceptions, one of the things that we have learned is that many states across the US have COVID-19 liability shields where states restrict lawsuits over virus exposure, injuries, or death for most of the businesses within the state. So again, these are state liability shields. You can see um, Florida and most of the Southeast does have uh, a fairly broad liability shield in place. Other states are proposing this in the legislature and others have limited or no liability. So we wanted to make you aware of you know, where the, the legal standing, the legal community stands right now. Um, going back to the federal perspective, the William Steger Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, and this is a direct quote from that health act, requires in part that every employer covered under the act furnished to his employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his employees. So this is the federal OSHA requirement. And one thing to keep in mind about that is even though OSHA law doesn't have some specific mention of, of COVID, that it does fall under those general, uh, general guidelines. So don't, don't figure that just because it doesn't specifically say it, that it's, it's not a requirement that OSHA is looking at the efforts that you make when they do make investigations. So uh, keep that in mind. Yeah, that's a great point, Mike. So what states do and federal do are two different things. So um, we wanted to see if there was any cases in play already that were specific to COVID-19 penalties inflicted on an agribusiness. Um, this is one of the cases that we found in Washington state where two workers on a farm passed away from COVID-19 and that farm was fined more than $2 million for repeatedly violating coronavirus safety procedures. The story came out at the end of December in 2020. This was prior to us having vaccines available at all. So these are uh, virus safety procedures that we knew best to our knowledge at that point, masks and distancing and cohort grouping of workers and the like. So uh, quoting the director of the Washington State Department of Labor, Joel Sachs notes that it's unacceptable to choose to ignore health and safety rules. And this farm did indeed bear a financial price for being um, found guilty of violating that. OSHA did come out with, in late January of 2021, a workplace COVID-19 prevention program. And we share this with you because these are the workplace guidances that OSHA has shared with us that are specific to COVID-19. So they are looking for the agribusiness or the farm to conduct a hazard assessment. And this would also apply to farm labor contractors. Uh, take multiple steps to limit the spread, which is why we shared that with you in our first two parts, three parts of this talk. Um, keeping infected or potentially infected workers away, protecting workers against retaliation for reporting that they don't feel well or seeking medical help, um, and informing workers of these policies in a language that they understand. We know many of our farm workers do not have English as the first language, so it is important and OSHA expects us to provide that information to our workers. And you should also keep in mind that if you're subject to food safety standards that uh, understand that many of those are also requiring COVID related uh, precautions and mitigation procedures. So that, that obviously can affect your ability to sell your produce. And so that's another thing to check and keep in mind in addition to the OSHA standards. 
And, and that, that's another motivation for why we prepared this presentation here in May of 2021 when vaccines are largely available across the US to most everyone. Um, but we are still concerned with making sure we keep other health and safety measures in play. Many of the COVID-19 safety measures are very close, as Mike says, to food safety measures. So they may be different organizations that would come in and inspect your company or your operations for that, but they are still um, well worth keeping in play. Many of you have already done this all through 2020. And so from our perspective, from a, a business risk strategy management perspective, we encourage you to keep doing that, which is why we share this with you today. Um, and the other side, side of this is what does it cost to quarantine workers that aren't well or are, are suspected of being infected by others in their cohort group or shut down a processing line or a packing line or even hire and train or source a replacement for that individual or group of individuals while they're either ill and, and fighting the illness or they're in quarantine. So it's all relative in terms of the cost of maintaining the strategies that we recommend in the first part of this presentation. Um, Purdue University put out a food and ag vulnerability index dashboard to help us kind of understand the number of ag workers across the US and different states and across different commodities where they are working. In this example, we looked under vegetables in Florida, vegetable production in the state of Florida, and they did find a total of just over 19,000 COVID-19 cases. And they also estimated a lost uh, productivity or lost production impact for just vegetables in the state of Florida of 11% since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when margins are tight in, in fruit and vegetable production or any production, 11% loss is significant. And so again, another reason why you want to consider keeping any preventative measures and practices in place for your own business risk management strategy. We also wanted to make everyone aware of the HR 133 bill, which is a USDA pandemic assistance to producers um, addendum where in 2021, they added another $97 million. And again, this is in the state of Florida to program funds. And these are targeting organizations that will assist farm workers and their employers who are investing in personal protective equipment, vaccination costs, transportation to vaccines or testing, uh, added facilities, separated separation um, strategies like we presented with you all with reducing the number of folks in a certain space and putting plastic up. This is all a source of funds to help recur some of those costs and also pave them going forward. Um, again, they are aimed at farmers, food businesses, and other relevant entities, and they may cover expenses retroactive up to six months. So the application for this program are coming due here shortly, and we encourage you to reach out to Josh Johnson, who is the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services Grant Manager. His email and phone number are there for you. And also note these grants, if awarded, would be funded in October, but they would cover expenses back to April of 2021 as well. So be sure to document your expenses as you incur them that are specific to protecting workforce from COVID-19. Another slide we wanted to share with you is a survey done by uh, Arizona State and the, they spoke with several uh, companies to try to get an idea on what they are doing as a company to have policies in place to to protect their employees specific to COVID-19 and also to COVID-19 vaccination. This has been a topic of interest to a lot of folks. So they actually asked the businesses, what are you guys doing? So they told the group here in April of 2021 that 88% of the employers are going to require or encourage vaccine for their employees. 40% are going to require that their employees be vaccinated against COVID-19. 32% are encouraging, another 16% are requiring some of their more high risk or essential employees to be vaccinated. 8% um, don't have a plan or a policy, 4% don't have a plan. Again, looking back to the OSHA requirements, they're looking for you to have a written plan in place specific to COVID-19 and protecting your employees. So there's just some information as to what other businesses are doing as we continue to adapt and adjust to the impact of the pandemic, potential variants, and potential for it becoming endemic here in the U.S. Additional impacts on the bottom line, you know, promoting prevention. Again, some companies or some individuals may not 
want to be vaccinated and we all respect everyone's right to privacy and to their own personal decisions for their health and well-being. But are there ways that a company could potentially promote preventative uh, practices taken by their employees or incentivize testing and vaccination? Should that be a part of your farm policy? So these are a couple of examples that we found over the past little while. This was a May 7th, 2021 article where cities, states, and businesses are providing perks to individuals who've gotten their vaccines. Krispy Kreme came out with one of the first motivating um, incentives here. With, you got a vaccine, then they, you got a free donut. So um, tells you that there's not much folks want to do for a donut. <laughs> Um, in West Virginia, the governor came up with a $100 savings bond program to encourage younger people ages 16 to 35 to get the vaccine. Maryland incentivized vaccines with $100 payments to state employees who choose to get a vaccine. And again, this is a way for them to incentivize and reinforce the importance of getting the vaccine as they decide what their own personal choice may be. In Ohio, the governor came out with a very big cash incentive, a chance of winning a million dollar prize. And he started this at the end of May 26, as vaccines were becoming more widely available. Um, adults who'd gotten at least one dose were entered to win a million dollar prize. And they did this over a five week period. So they also offered those who were under 18 to receive a vaccine to potentially win four years of tuition to Ohio Public University. So they're choosing five individual, individuals for that. And these states are all ones that have a liability protection um, legislation in place for their businesses, but they are still, even state employees, they're still thinking of creative ways to help incentivize people to consider this as an option to prevent and protect their own health and that of their communities. Um, what are companies doing? Again, this, this article we share with you because it is more specific to companies that buy ag food or food related products. Um, Target offered extra pay and free transportation to hourly employees. So again, these are maybe potential strategies that you might use to motivate your workers. Um, another dozen companies as of this was in February had offered incentives, discount grocers, Aldi, uh, Trader General had offered uh, four hours of pay for the folks that had gotten both doses. Kroger was offering a one-time payment to their employees. And several other companies, including Chobani, Darden's, and McDonald's, have also announced cash payments to their employees. Again, these are all folks that buy products, food products from, from us. So if they're asking or motivating their employees, my expectation or my recommendation as an economist is that they're going to be looking for their vendors to do or consider similar incentive programs as we continue to protect our health going forward. A major grocery union released a new tally of workers in its unions who had gotten sick or died. Again, these were essential folks that kept on packing groceries for us and providing that service to many of us that were able to stay home and shelter in place. They came up with more than 30,000 grocery workers who'd been infected or exposed to COVID-19, and at least 137 grocery workers had passed away. Um, this doesn't include workers at grocery stores, distribution centers, or other food-related workplaces who are not unionized, which includes some of our biggest, Target, Walmart, Amazon, Whole Foods, and Trader Joe. So again, if, if they're seeing these numbers in the labor unions, folks that work for our vendors or retailers who buy from us, I would suggest that you consider adapting practices similar to theirs as to show that you are also investing as best you can to help motivate people to make decisions. So to kind of wrap this up, you know, bringing in the state state regulations as we understand them, OSHA and federal regulations, what we see companies doing across the line and then also even um, political decisions or motivations for it. We definitely suggest that you establish and document in writing and in pictures, taking pictures of posters. Many of the posters we share here today, they're all available at the links that we provided. We encourage you to find them. Many can be personalized to your company. Um, and they can all be posted in and around your business, taking pictures of that, documenting that those are to be updated and placed in areas where workers work or congregate or on or off farm. This is all ways for you to let your buyers know and your employees know that you're doing the best you can to help mitigate and protect their health, mitigate any negative effects. Screening, temperature and wellness procedures that we've shared with you today. We encourage you again document that that is part of your business practice going forward. 
Um, again, using cohort groups where you keep workers who live together, they travel on the same bus together, they work in the same field or in the same part of the packing house together, um, keeping them in groups so that you are able to minimize the spread should someone become ill and you need to quarantine just makes it easier Again, putting this in practice into play and then documenting that you're doing so. We would strongly encourage quarantine procedures and facilities so people know, you know, take a quick moment to educate your workers about this as you're in their training process, that this is what you do when you feel ill, this is who you reach out to. So it makes it very clear the sort of chain of command because we all know we don't feel good. The last thing we wanna do is run around trying to figure out what we're supposed to do or be concerned we're gonna lose our jobs because of it. Access to masks, PPE supplies and equipment. Um, keep track of your COVID-19 related expenses. There's that one opportunity to get some of those funds reimbursed to you, but either way, you know, keeping track of that. So it's further proof and evidence that you are doing all you can to protect your workforce and then provide or consider providing any vaccine or testing incentives. Should that work with your business policy and procedures, make sure you've documented that you have done so. When you have the health department out to your farm, you know, you keep track of that event and that, you know, how many folks they, they were able to vaccinate or educate. And again, it's just part of keeping your business protected and documenting all the efforts that you're doing. We've seen many creative um, efforts underway. We shared with you some of those pictures. Um, we spoke with a labor contractor, a crew leader, and he had a group of folks, he had three groups of workers that he worked with, two, two sets of them had been fully vaccinated and another set had not yet. And so he was keeping them on separate buses and you know keeping masks in place for folks that weren't vaccinated. So he made it a little easier for his workers. So these are the kinds of things you wanna document so that your buyers know and your consumers know what you're doing. This is another example of a poster that CEC provides. They also offer these in multiple languages. So we encourage you to take, take advantage of these and take care of yourself and help slow the spread of COVID-19 and, and use some of this material that's been put together and document what you're doing. And we certainly need to remember that even though we've gotten vaccinations going now that it's, it's not over yet. As recently, I think as last month or in the end of April, uh, Immokalee had at least two people from the ag industry passed away from COVID-19. So it, it's not over yet. And that's why you still need to consider and, and institute these uh, procedures and mitigation things so that you can protect everybody. That's right. And as we continue to hear more from CDC and they learn by doing and learn by observing and collecting data, we don't know how long the vaccine effectiveness may extend coverage to us that have had it. We don't know if the pandemic variants are going to be, how impactful they're going to be. And then we don't know if it's going to become endemic like the flu where we all are expected to have vaccines repeatedly or encouraged to do so. So we will keep on educating and updating you as much as we can find that out. So that's another thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot of things the CDC is still monitoring and other World Health Organizations, and we will share that with you as we are able. But and for now, we encourage you to follow the links that we've included here. CDC and OSHA guidance are the two we most strongly encourage you to have a look at because these do directly impact your business success and, and profitability as you work to protect your workforce. They also have them in English, Spanish, and Haitian Creole, which is many of the languages spoken by our workforce here in Florida. Southeastern Coastal Center for Ag Health and Safety. Uh, they've focused quite a bit of their efforts on COVID-19, including Dr. Mike Lazardo, who we showed in our video. He also does um, similar lectures in Spanish, and those are offered through their website. We encourage you to have a look at those, and they're keeping that updated. Other resources, of course, your state and local health departments. Um, IFAS here in the University of Florida or any state land grant, county extension offices, reach out to them if you can't find materials or you're not sure what's going on or you're trying to help understand fact versus fiction as we continue to monitor what's going on with the pandemic and how it specifically affects our ag industry. So with that, a quick thank you to all of the folks that are involved in our farm labor supervisor training program here at the Southwest Florida Research and Education Center in Immokalee. Uh, all of these folks were with us today. I'm Kim Morgan. Barb Hyman is keeping track of us in the background. Carlene Thyssen was our first speaker and Michael Baer, our second speaker. 
The other folks have all contributed quite a bit to helping us produce this in Spanish. We do have Spanish versions, so have a link at the link below and see if that would work for you to share with you. So again, we thank you for your time. Stay well. Thank you very much.